Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage General Manager Black Hat Trey Ford. Good morning. Welcome. Before we get started, I want to take a moment with you. I'd like to call for a moment of solidarity. I would like to join I would like you to join me now in a moment of silence to honor Barnaby Jack. Black Hat remains focused on the community. We love you guys, and that is why we're here. We know that Barnaby would be proud of the amazing work we're going to showcase this year, and with that, Black Hat is proud of what you've done and to share this with you this year. Sorry for the start with a somber note. We're actually very excited about the show this year. There's just a lot of emotion in the room. Our next speaker really does not need any kind of an introduction. I think we're all very excited to hear from the general. The time for this conversation to happen is now. Black Hat is the place for this conversation. Something we need to keep in mind is this notion that we've been nursing of a balance between security and privacy and whether the two can coexist, and if so, how that would work. We reached out to the community. We collected questions from the Black Hat Review Board from select members of the community. We sent those out and surveyed with you. You got that information back to us. We shared that with the general. I believe that our communities are deeply linked, the security community, the intelligence community, and I think it's time for the general to come set some facts straight. The conversation cannot continue effectively without uh, getting some insight, some perspective, some clarity on the facts. Yeah, I think... um I've never sensed this level of uh, tension or apprehension in the community since, I would say, I don't know how many people here were around for the crypto wars in the, uh, in the late 90s, right? I mean, that was a pretty stressful time, and that pales in comparison to what's going on now. That was, how do we export math? How do we control cryptography? The clipper chip, you know, the government might want to listen into our phone calls. <laughs> how times have changed. Um, <laughs> So, so I think a lot of us are wondering, like, well, what comes next, right? We're now starting to face these issues that, that we've only been hinted at. And rumor has it that the general's a pretty busy guy, and I think it would have been easy for him to sort of duck out and not come speak to us, you know, go to a meeting. But instead, uh, he's coming here to speak with us, not because he has to, but because he wants to. And I think that really speaks toward his integrity and his interest in engaging with us and with the community. And um, you know, last year, I'd been trying to get a director of NSA to speak at DEF CON for as long as I've been doing DEF CON. And finally, one came to DEF CON last year, General Alexander. And he tried to start a conversation with us about shared values. And then how do we set the needle on civil liberties, privacy, but security? And it's never going to be a static needle. This needle is going to move around. But but how do we set it? And I think he's a big believer in that technology and working with communities such as ours can lead to a more transparent and easier way of setting the needle. Because it's going to get set one way or the other. Um, And I think what's happening here is there's this tension between offense seems to be really winning right now. I mean, offense is doing sweet. Defense, not so much. And so a lot of people are thinking, well, so what does that mean? What does that mean to my business? Well, how are you going to move forward in this environment of sort of like all pervasive offense capabilities? And I think really this is giving us an opportunity now to finally have this conversation that we've all been wanting to have for five or ten years. And I think the general wants to have that conversation as well. So uh, I think this topic is more important than ever, and I'm just really proud that uh, these things are going to start happening here. I think we all look forward to hearing from the general. Um, I think we can all respect that there's a lot of things he can't share with us. I think that uh, we have a responsibility to try to set aside hyperbole to give a very focused look at the facts. Without further ado, let's welcome General Alexander to the stage.
Well, Trey and Jeff, thanks. Thanks for that introduction. Uh, I think what they said to start out with is the reason I'm here. Um, this is the technical foundation for our world's communications, you folks right here. And the issue that stands before us today is one of what do we do next? How do we start this discussion on defending our nation and protecting our civil liberties and privacy? The reason I'm here is because you may have some ideas of how we can do it better. We need to hear those ideas. But equally important from my perspective is that you get the facts. And so what I'm going to do today is try to lay out those facts. Now, as Trey or Jeff said, there are good reasons why some of this is classified and why some of it is stuff that we just don't put out there. And the big reason from my perspective is because terrorists use our communications. They live among us. How do we come up with a program to stop terrorism and to protect our civil liberties and privacy. This is perhaps one of the biggest issues facing our country today. I also want you to get a sense for the people at the National Security Agency. It has been the greatest honor and privilege of my life to lead these noble folks. They're the ones, and you'll get a little bit of sense of what they've done for our country over the past um, eight years while I've been there. And their reputation is tarnished because all the facts aren't on the table. But you can help us articulate the facts properly. I will answer every question to the fullest extent possible. And I promise you the truth. What we know, what we're doing, and what I cannot tell you because we don't want to jeopardize our future defense. What we're going to do in this briefing is give you the facts on these programs, the business record, FISA, on FAA 702, on what we've done to stop terrorist attacks, address some of the problems that we see out there with inaccurate statements, and talk about where do we go from here. That's where you come in. We need to hear from you because the tools and the things we use are very much the same as the tools that many of you use in securing networks. The difference, in part, is the oversight and the compliance that we have in these programs. That part is missing in much of the discussion. I believe it's important for you to hear that, for you to understand what these people have to do in order to do their job to defend this nation and the oversight regime that we have with the courts, with Congress, and with the administration. I think you need to understand that to get the full understanding of what we do and what we do not do. I think it's important to also step back. Let's go back to the beginning. How did we get here? And normally being a general, I would say, next slide, but they gave me a device. <laughs> and they said, figure it out. <laughs> it says Q, I thought that would be clue, okay. So, there we go. Let's go back to 1993, the World Trade Center. It goes pretty quickly. Cobar Towers, the East Africa Embassy bombings, the USS Cole, 9-11. Al-Qaeda 
on the ones on the bottom there. Throughout, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed helped fund the first World Trade Center and was the mastermind behind 9-11. We became a nation transformed. The intelligence community, according to the 9-11 Commission, failed to connect the dots. What do I mean by that? What do I mean by failed to connect the dots? We had intercepts of one of the 9-11 hijackers, Midar, from Yemen. We didn't know because we didn't have the tools and the capabilities to see that he was actually in California. We couldn't provide the right tip or information that connected that foreign dot to a domestic plot. The intelligence community failed to connect those dots. And now what we're doing is putting into existence these programs. But I think in order to understand, so how do we actually use these programs, from my perspective, it's important to first understand the people at the National Security Agency, what they do and how they do it. So from my perspective, the best first thing is to step back and say, what did they do during this time period? What are they doing? And so our job is defending this country, saving lives, supporting our troops in combat. And when you think about our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines that were in Iraq and in Afghanistan, it is our responsibility, along with the rest of the intelligence community, to provide the information that they need to survive, to go after the enemy. What you see on this slide is one of those tools that we brought to bear. This is a technical tool. What's not shown on the slide is the thousands of NSA personnel who volunteered to go forward. Over 6,000 NSA employees have gone to Afghanistan and Iraq. 20 of those cryptologists paid the ultimate price to ensure our troops had the intelligence they need. That's a noble purpose. That's what these people do. And you can see the impact. And for me, it was an honor and privilege to work with these folks. The time and the effort that they spent. Our discussions with General Dave Petraeus, General Stan McChrystal, Ray Odierno, Lloyd Austin, and Admiral Bill Clay Craven. Our job was to provide that intelligence that they need and the timeliness that they needed it to help them go after the adversary. And you can see the significant drop that occurred as we implemented those capabilities in Iraq and our troops went forward. This is absolutely superb. The mindset of these people is foreign intelligence to save lives, our lives, our military, our civilian. That is a true noble effort. And those are the types of people I have the great honor and privilege to lead. But the discussion today has to take that next step. Well, what about counterterrorism? And what do we do about the discussion that I put on the table from the World Trade Center in 1993 to 9-11? What now? We failed to connect the dots. And so we had to come up with a way of helping to stop the attack. Our government, Congress, the administration, and the courts all joined together to come up with programs that would meet our Constitution and help us connect those dots. 
I think it's important to understand the strict oversight that goes in on these programs. Because the assumption is that people are out there just wheeling and dealing. And nothing could be further from the truth. We have tremendous oversight and compliance in these programs. Auditability. And for many of you with a technical background that work NetFlow and other things like that, you know that we can audit the actions of our people, 100% in this case, and we do that. But this information and the way our country has put it together is something that we should also put forward as an example for the rest of the world. Because what comes out is we're collecting everything. That is not true. What we're doing is for foreign intelligence purposes to go after counterterrorism, counterproliferation, cyber attacks. And it's focused. And if you think about NetFlow and the amount of information, you couldn't afford or don't want to collect everything. It makes your analysis harder. If your intent is to go after terrorists, how do you do that? And so there are two programs that we have here, a metadata program, one that helps us connect the dots in the least intrusive way that we can, and the uh, FAA 702 or Section 702 authority, which allows us to go after content. I'm going to go into each of these in detail. But I wanted to put out one thing that's important. Industry just doesn't dump stuff to us and say, hey, here's some interesting facts. They are compelled by a court order to comply. They are compelled by a court order to comply where all three branches of our government have come together. Think about the lawful intercept program that we have here. I think this is a standard for other countries because we have the court overseeing it. We have Congress overseeing it. And we have the administration, and I'll go into all the different parts of the administration that oversees that. And I've heard some people say that the court is a rubber stamp. I'm on the other end of that table with federal judges. And anybody here who's been up against a federal judge knows that these are people with tremendous legal experience that don't take any, I'm trying to think of a word here, <laughs> from even a four-star general. They want to make sure that what we're doing comports with the Constitution and the law. And they are dead serious on it. These are folks that have given their whole lives to our nation's judiciary system. These are folks who know they're probably not going to go to the Supreme Court, but they want to do something for our nation. These are tremendous judges. They aren't a rubber stamp. And I've been in front of that court a number of times. I can tell you from the wire brushings that I've received, they are not a rubber stamp. Let's go into the details of, of these programs. Press the button. I thought it would be important to give you a picture of what our analysts actually see. There it is on the right hand side. This is for counterterrorism purposes a program that is designed to go after communications of foreign terrorist organizations to help us connect those dots from a foreign actor to someone who may be in the United States trying to do us harm. This program was designed specifically to help us go after that MIDAR case. I think it's important to have some of the facts on the table here and for me to give you more of those, more facts. First, as you can see, what you have is the date time of the call, 
the calling number and the called number, the duration of the call. And we also put in the origin of the metadata and you can see it says business record FISA just as another case because our analysts who work this, that's a flag for them that says heads up, this is important court data. This does not include the content of communications. This does not include your phone calls or mine, your emails nor mine, your SMS messages. There is no content. There are no names in the database, no address, no credit card numbers, and no locational information is used. Let me give you an example of how this was important how the foreign intelligence agencies like CIA and NSA work with FBI to help stop terrorist activities. And this actually was given out publicly on Basali Mualan, a terrorist who was in California. We had an intercept of a communication in Somalia, a phone number, a person talking about terrorist activities. And that phone number, based on what they were talking about, allowed us to look into the database. What does that mean? The database is like a lockbox. The controls that go on this database are greater than any data repository in government. And the oversight is the same. To get a number approved, there are only 22 people at NSA that can approve that number. They have to approve that that meets a standard set by the court, that this has that counterterrorism nexus with Al Qaeda related groups. Then and only then is that number added to a list that can be queried. Only those numbers on that list can be queried into that database. If you mistype a number, the database will reject it because it has to be on that list. Only 35 analysts at NSA are authorized to run queries. They have to go through three separate different training regimen and pass tests to, do, to actually do queries into that database. In 2012, there were less than 300 numbers approved, bless you, approved for queries. Less than 300 numbers. Those queries resulted in 12 reports to the FBI. Those reports contained less than 500 numbers not millions, not hundreds of thousands, not tens of thousands, less than 500. The intent of this program was to find a terrorist actor and identify that to the FBI. If you think about it, the FBI is a great agency. Director Bob Mueller is one of the greatest people I have ever met. His agency does tremendous work for this country. Our job is not to complicate his life by giving him as many numbers as we can. Our job is to help him focus on the right numbers. And the number that we gave him in California, they had actually had, we gave that to them in 2007. In 2004, they had run an investigation on that individual but did not have enough information to open up a full field investigation. So they closed that investigation down. In 2007, with the number we gave them, they had enough information. They take that number, and now their portion of this is they can take a national security letter, find out who that number belongs to, and they found out it was Basali Mualan. They can then, with probable cause, 
get a warrant. NSA only has the fact of a number. FBI can take that, see where it connects to, use national security le letter and the legal authorities given to them to take the next step. That resulted in the capture of Bazali Mualan for material support to terrorism and several co-conspirators. The other program that I would like to talk to is the one we refer to sometimes as PRISM, but PRISM is part of it. It's the FAA 702 Authority. This is for foreign intelligence purposes. This is content. This is not targeting U.S. persons. This is targeting threats overseas. This is our lawful intercept program, which is analogous to many other countries around the world. They compel service providers to provide information just as we do. But I mentioned earlier, we have, I believe, a great standard when we look at the court, Congress, and the administration all looking at what we do on each of these. I should mention on the previous slide, 100% auditability. So let me just go back to that. I didn't, I didn't give you that part, and I promised I would, so I don't want you to think I left that out. 100% audibility. Well, that was quick. So maybe they, there is a no going back. So on this program, 100% auditability on every query that we make. And that is overseen by our Inspector General, our General con uh, Counsel, in 2009, in our discussions with the President, when he first came on board, we talked to him about these programs. And the issue was, how do we know the compliance is there and what more could we do? We stood up, working with the committees in Congress, a directorate of compliance. This directorate of compliance is headed by legal professionals and information specialists that can look at everything that we do in these programs and ensure they comport with the court orders. But we also have oversight from the Director of National Intelligence, General Counsel and IG, from the Defense Department, from the Department of Justice, from the White House, from Congress, the Intel Committees, and from the courts. Our people have to take courses and pass exams to use this data. So the same level of control is given to the FAA 702 data. In fact, this is the one that at times people say they're listening to all our communications. That is not authorized under this. But the issue would be, for me standing up here, many are going to say, well, I hear what you're saying, but I don't trust that. Congress did a review of this program over a four-year period the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence. And over that four-year period, they found no willful or knowledgeable violations of the law or the intent of the law in this program. More specifically, they found no one at NSA had ever gone outside the boundaries of what we've been given. That's the fact. What you're hearing, what you're seeing, what people are saying is, well, they could. 
The fact is, they don't. And if they did, our auditing tools would detect them, and they would be held accountable. And they know that from the courses that they take and the pledge that they've made to this nation. And they take that very seriously. Remember, their intent is not to go after our communications. Their intent is to find the terrorist that walks among us. How do we do that? So we have two programs that help us do that. One is on metadata, the least intrusive measure that we could figure out. And that's something that we should discuss that allows us to hone in and give the FBI greater insights into these actors. And we have this content program, again audited, again our people that go through this have to go through these courses and pass those tests. There are allegations out there that they listen to all our emails. They do all these things. That's wrong. We don't. And if we did, we would be held accountable. 100% auditability on what we do here. At times, I look at that and say, is this too much? Our people say it's the right thing to do. The nation needs to know we're going to do the right thing. We comply with the court orders and do this exactly right. And if we make a mistake, we hold ourselves accountable and report it to everyone. I want to give you an example of what this means to us, what this means to our nation. I'm going to talk about the Zazi case or the New York City subway bombing because I think it's important for you to understand how these programs come together. NSA, our CIA, our foreign intelligence agencies, our allies have good ways to go after terrorists. One of those was an Al-Qaeda operative operating out of Pakistan. And we had insights to some of his communications and what he was doing. We took his name and through the 702 court, compelled one of the service providers to give us the content of his communications, his email. In those emails, we saw him working with an individual unknown to us, discussing an imminent terrorist attack. All we knew, they were looking for the recipes for bombs. We had an email address, and in the email was a phone number. We didn't know if the phone number was U.S. or overseas. We gave the email address to the FBI. Again, the FBI has legal authorities then to take that email address and find out whose address is this. And this was Najibuli Zazi, a terrorist in Colorado. And they told us that the phone number that was in that email was his. We used that phone number to go into the business records FISA data because it had nexus to an Al-Qaeda related operation we found the first connection from that phone number in Colorado to an unknown phone number to the FBI in New York City. But the important thing was that phone number in New York City also was talking to another terrorist-related actor. And on a, another layer out to yet another terrorist. That helped us tell the FBI that number in New York City is really important. 
That number was Addis Medijunin. Time was of the essence in this case. You may recall that Zazi was driving across the country to conduct the attack. We intercepted this around the 6th of September and the attack was supposed to occur by 14 September. The FBI has to put these pieces together based on our input, what they get from Customs and Border Patrol, what they get from other intelligence agencies and law enforcement and figure out what's going on. They are superb. They stopped this attack. This would have been the biggest attack in the United States since 9-11. It came, the initial tip came from the PRISM FAA 702 data. The business record FISA is a tool that also adds value, but it can only add value in the United States. So what does that mean? What have these capabilities done? We have talked about 54 different terrorist-related activities. I put them up here so that you can see what we've been able to do. These are facts. This is a partnership between our foreign intelligence agencies and the FBI, between our country and our allies. We stopped 13 related terrorist activities in the United States and 25 more in Europe. There are a number of things that comes out of this slide. First, the business record FISA can only help in those that are in the United States. It had a role in 12 of those 13. In four, it came up with no results that was operation of operational value to the FBI. In the other eight, it provided leads for the FBI to go after. FAA 702 provides value across 53 of these. And in roughly half of them, it was the initial tip. Our nation takes stopping terrorism as one of the most important things. Freedom. Exactly. And with that, when you think about it, how do we do that? Because we stand for freedom. <laughs> Not that. <laughs> but I think what you're saying is that in these cases, what's the decision? Where's the discussion? And what tools should we have to stop those? No, I'm saying I don't trust you. You lied to Congress. Why, why would we believe you're not lying to us right now? I haven't lied to Congress. What about XKS? Congressional testimony. Wait for the question session. Thank you for that. But I do think this is important for us to have this discussion because, in my opinion, what you quickly believe is that which is written in the press without looking at the facts. This is the greatest technical center of gravity in the world. I ask that you all look at those facts. Check that out. Read the congressional testimony. Look at what we're talking about here because this is our nation's future. 
This is what we've done with these programs. And in my opinion, that's not bull. Those are facts. And what we see coming at our country is more of the same. So the question that we have with all of us, so what do we do? Let's begin that discussion. We ought to put the facts on the table and have that discussion so that people who are revealing information that can hurt the future of this country and our citizens, I believe that is irresponsible and will have significant damage to our country. How do we defend this country? That's the question. What you're asking us to do is to defend the country and we take a note to that Constitution and we take that very seriously. It's not either or, it's both. And so here, if you want to be constructive and you want to help get this right, be part of that discussion. Put the facts on the table. That's what we need. You need to understand what we're trying to do to defend the country and protect civil liberties and privacy. On the business record FISA, 15 judges have approved that 34 times. Congress, the courts, and the administrations have looked at it. This morning, the Director of National Intelligence declassified some of those. Review that. See what we do in going after these. So with that, I'd like to open it up for questions. Forgive me, guys. Um, generally speaking, you, uh, we provide the keynote the opportunity to determine if he wants to accept questions from the audience or to uh, receive them uh, in an organized manner. We reached out to the community to try to gather those, to organize those. We weighed them, we ranked them. Um, this is not can. The general doesn't know what we're throwing at him, but I want to make sure that we're asking your questions for you. We've got a very limited amount of time. If I'll I could, though, I, please. You know, I have no problem answering that question because I think that's a great question. Why? Repeat, so Repeat the, question, the question. So the question that was asked was, so why do countries want to attack us? Why does Al-Qaeda want to attack us? Why do we stand in the way of them reaching their objective? And I think you should look at what they're trying to create, a caliphate. They believe that the Middle East should be run under the Islamic law, Sharia form of law, and that everybody should comply with that form of law, and that we, the United States, working in the Middle East, have stood in their way. They want to attack us. They want to attack us because we're bombing them. Go ahead. So, so it, is, it is interesting that when you look at it, go back to the facts of 93, the World Trade Center, the coal. Look at the East Africa Embassy bombings. Look at 9-11. And so that's what we face. Go ahead. General, the uh, top-rated question was uh, question number seven on the survey. Do you think our national security intelligence and monitoring initiatives negatively impacts our innovative domestic capabilities ability, companies' ability to adequately grow in foreign markets over fears of backdoors or covert access? More directly, is the NSA making U.S. companies less competitive? I, that's a great question. So the, from my perspective, I think it's important that we put the facts on the table of what lawful intercept is and what these companies are compelled to comply with. And every country 
has lawful intercept, or almost every country has lawful intercept programs that compel companies to provide information. The difference from my perspective is the oversight by the courts, Congress, and the administration in ensuring that we do this right. Go ahead. There was a great question posed yesterday. I would like to echo that. Um, there was a clear difference between the NSA cannot and the NSA will not. It's a discretionary or it's a preventative control. So there are both. I think there are technical things that we can do to limit our collection. And we do that. In the United States, if you think about NetFlow and what you do perhaps in securing a network, how you look at different parts, you can shield off certain parts from collecting net flow data. We do the same thing to ensure we comply with the law. So the domestic communications we can technically take off. But there has to be another set of standards because the reality is communications oftentimes are international. What happens if we run into a U.S. person's communications? So part of what has been recently released talks about the minimization procedures, the training that everyone at NSA has to go through if we run across those communications. And we hold our people accountable to doing that exactly right. Uh, one question that came up a lot out of band was uh, once a classified document is publicly leaked, in, as in the case of the PRISM documents, why does the classification remain the same? Why can't government employees look at the internet? Well, <laughs> well there's two reasons on that one. <clears throat> um, I think the issue is on this, how do we protect our nation? How do we defend it? You know, some of this is classified. It's not classified to keep it from you, a good person. It's classified because sitting among you are people who wish us harm. If we tell everybody exactly what we're doing, then the adversaries will know how to get through our defenses. That's why I believe that what has happened, the damage to our country is significant and irreversible. What we're talking about is future terrorist attacks. And when you look on this slide here, will we have the success over the next 10 years that we've had over the last? And I think it is worth considering what would have happened in the world if those attacks, 42 of those 54, were terrorist plots. If they were successfully executed, what would that mean to our civil liberties and privacy? So those are issues. Now, why do we classify stuff? Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, General, I know the NSA doesn't shop where we do. Um, our attendees here at Black Hat have a certain cadre of tools in our arsenal for defense. Our adversaries are well-read, well-steeped, have access to our tools and means. Uh, we appreciate the glimpse into what the NSA is doing, and I know you can't share more, um, but I would like you to speak to your, your position on whether or not these media leaks have affected the NSA. Well, it has. Um... You know, and I think you can hear it from some of the comments that we've gotten here, the sporadic comments. You see, think about people who are willing to go forward to Iraq and Afghanistan to help ensure our soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marine, and the civilians get the intelligence that they need. I believe these are the most noble people that we have in this country. They are willing to put their lives on the line for their, fellow, for their fellow soldiers and fellow Americans and other countries. And 20 of them lost their lives. And when you think about that, the issue is these same people who take that same 
oath to uphold and defend the Constitution are the ones that run these programs. And we get all these allegations of what they could be doing, but when people check, like the Intelligence Committee, they found zero times that's happened. And that's no bullshit. Those are facts. Please don't put that out in open press. <laughs> Just that one word. I have 15 grandchildren. <laughs> All right, one more question before we break, General. Um, in a moment, I'm going to talk to my mom and dad, and uh, I just want to know, your people can't listen to me to call my mom, right? That's correct. Okay. And now there's two parts to that. You... <laughs> That's a yes or no question. <laughs> and I, and I, think, I think it's one, you're a great, you know, I think, here's the issue as you, as you put that out there. One, we have technical controls to limit that. And then we have policy. So the technical is they can't. You know, I ask the same thing about my daughters. I have four daughters. Can I go and intercept their emails? No. Can you? And, and it's in the reason you may be able to. <laughs> but but the technical limitations are in there. Now people who try to circumvent that. There is also 100% auditing. So when you put in my daughter at x.com, and an auditor then looks and says, what's the foreign intelligence purpose of this query? And the analyst putting that in has to state that and show that what they're doing meets that standard. Is it Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Trey's a good person. No terrorist, well, I guess, I hope. <laughs> no terrorist associate. So, so the issue really becomes the issue that I would ask you to look at. And all of those that find what we're doing that should be limited more, my comment is help us defend the country and come up with a better solution. You're the greatest gathering of technical talent anywhere in the world. If we can make this better, the whole reason I came here was to ask you to help us make it better. And if you disagree with what we're doing, then you should help twice as much. Read the Constitution. I have. You should too. General, I, uh, I know that it would have been a lot easier to not come. Um, Black Hat is a warm, loving crowd that loves, you know, guests in a different way. Yeah. But thank you so much for coming out. Thank you.